everyone leon i already see you in there like always do me a favor too tonight leon let me know if the screen freezes up i might have to move it's, this is weird when i'm closer to the router it seems like it doesn't work but the farther i tweet it's on but if it starts freezing up just let me know please and uh thank you guys for uh tuning in to another episode of um Loomis Reads, Big Boy Blue, always in the house. What's up, man? Hey, if you did anything lately, send it to me. Uh, I want to uh, definitely check it out, man. You're the one that like inspired me to start doing these, but I'm going to do these though a different way, though, I think. Um, meaning that like instead of me just constantly just read and read and read, and maybe I'll read like three chapters, then I'll come on at night and explain or whatever. I mean, it all depends on whatever other people want, but I read anyway at night before I lay down. So like I always say, why not do this? And it's good practice for the show coming on. As you know, the regular schedule of Mafia Truth is every Sunday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. Last night we had a great show with uh, actress Jacqueline Seymour. I should say actress, singer, songwriter, author. She does a bunch of children's books. Um, Jacqueline was a great guest. We had a blast, and we're going to have another great guest for you that we'll announce midweek uh, for next week's episode of Mafia Truth. These are more just like little late night reads. That's why they're 11 o'clock late, like before, you know, we hit the sack, but let's see who we got. So I guess I'm doing all right now, Leon, right? We're not froze up. I got to see here. Tracy Gambell, what's up? Good morning. Well, good morning where you are. Is it morning yet here? Not like, will it be midnight morning, right? Good morning, Tracy. Thank you. La Senorita. How are we? Great. I was checking out your uh, YouTube little shorts. I was watching them earlier. and our, They were there. I like them a lot. Like the black and whites and all that. What's up? Uh, Luma's show you did with Jacqueline was great. Yeah, she, yeah, she was great. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Uh, we're going to have like the whole cast basically coming on who's involved with this project and um, weekly and then also still other guests that we already had scheduled before this project took, took flight. But uh, thank you, Leon. Beautiful. But uh, yes, uh, 
yesterday's episode was definitely awesome. And I just like the fact, though, now that I'm actually on a scheduled, uh, what is it, like Mafia Truth Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to try to squeeze in another one, maybe Saturday during the day or whatever. But we shall uh, see on that. And then uh, what else? Try to think. Yeah, just really been trying to work in this docu-series thing, guys, and then just, you know, still trying to do the show thing as well. And uh, it's a lot of work, but we're definitely, every day we're getting there more and more. It's like taking uh, shape almost like on, it's not on its own, it's the fact that everyone knows pitching in, everyone's helping out, and uh, it's incredible. So thank you very much. I know I always say this, if anyone's new here, if you don't mind, I don't... um, monetized you won't get any ads here so the deal is if you don't mind hit the subscribe button uh it's the best way you can support me and i really really appreciate that hit the like and subscribe leah hit the like get her moving thank you means much oh yeah you probably, you're welcome la senorita i can't get the uh roll down don't overdo it please how do you do great oh no i'm good hey we got it right working on I, my my mentality is um you know, work real hard nonstop until you hit the wall. Yeah, it's not that healthy, but then then you get to relax. You know, after all the hard work, one day hopefully it pays off, right? All right, let's see. I was just getting ready to just start chiming about anything, but then I forgot that we got the book. I can't believe we're this far though already that you guys sat there and listened to all this. Um, we are, yeah. That's where we're at. And tonight, I don't know, maybe one or two. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is the long chapter. Not long, but so we'll probably just do uh, one. Guys, um, what I usually do, if anyone's new to, is I read uh, a chapter and then, you know, we chat and see how what the time's like after that. And um, if there's nothing too much though to chat though about, then I'll read like another one or whatnot. But please don't talk much yourselves in the comments. It gets it moving. And at, please feel free to ask any questions at all. And uh, definitely will answer them. And uh, I think that is it. Oh, and also to uh, subscribe, please, to Mafia Truth. And if anyone wants to donate to the From the Grave Project uh, donation, uh, the link is in the description. And you can also be attached to the project as well. Reach out if you want more uh, further details about that. The link is in the description. If you want to remain anonymous, just let us know. All right, guys. Chapter 13, The Bodies Start Falling. <clears throat> All it takes to be a tough guy is to lose the fear of dying. Joe Barboza. In the early 1960s, male gangsters murdered other male gangsters with regularity, but the Boston Strangler was simultaneously helping balloon the death toll. He or they kept asphyxiating women of various ages, creeds, and colors. Police were baffled. So, after Punchy's arrest for stealing a pink negligee from a Roslindale department store, police gave him an extra grilling. Going underground for safety, Georgie McLaughlin borrowed, burrowed into the first floor of the three-story Archer Park housing project at 55 Yeoman Street in Dorchester. His consort apparently was Maureen Delamino, a 33-year-old divorcee who rented an apartment with her mother. On March 15, 1964, on the third story of the building, the Buckley family held it a christening. From the first floor, Georgie emerged in a brown suit and joined the party. Other revelers included William Sheridan, a 21-year-old freckle-faced bank clerk. Sheridan, who remained uncommonly sober, argued with the host's aunt and left the apartment at about 11 p.m. The elder Buckley followed him downstairs, hoping to talk. I want to go back up and apologize, Sheridan said. Forget it and do it later, Buckley advised. Back upstairs, Georgie gave Buckley $10 to replenish the beer supply. But since the festivities were concluded, Buckley refused. Around 12.15 a.m., the party began to disintegrate, and the Buckleys attempted to empty the apartment. At first, politely, 
then more forcefully, using fists and shoves. Clear the hallway, the Georgie commanded, but no one obeyed. Gentleman Georgie interrupted his chat with the reveler named Lynch to grab a beer bottle in his hand. After Lynch refused to yield the bottle, the two men argued. Georgie reached into his pocket as if he were looking for something before heading downstairs and entering the first floor apartment. He soon emerged into the hallway carrying a long-barreled revolver and sought out Lynch, but Lynch had left, passing by Sheridan, who was returning to the apartment upstairs with an apology. As Sheridan entered the hallway, he saw a squat Georgie blocking his path a few feet away. About 20 feet away in the courtyard was a tall, lanky ex-Marine and Dorchester native named Herbert Jocelyn. Through the illumination of the nearby hallway light, Jocelyn observed Georgie facing the taller Sheridan. Georgie's lips moved and Sheridan shrugged. Then Georgie raised his pistol, pointed it into Sheridan's face and pulled the trigger, creating an explosion. Sheridan collapsed as a bullet passed between his eyes and someone yelled, Yahoo, thinking a cherry bomb had gone off. Everyone in the courtyard st stampeded, leaving Sheridan alone, half in and half out of the doorway. He lay on his left side in the front hall, blood spurting from the cataract between his eyes and forming an expanding puddle on the front entrance landing. Upstairs, Buckley was clearing the living room of dirty glasses when he heard the ruckus in the hallway below. Opening the door, a hysterical Maureen Dalmano rushed in from the second floor landing. Georgie just shot somebody, she yelled. Get him out of here, please, please, please. Soon after, someone drove Georgie away into the night in Harold Hannon's car. Later that day, armed with riot guns, squads of patrolmen searched the project, but only turned up a bloody bullet in the high hallway. After Georgie blended into the landscape, the FBI exalted him to being a public enemy. During the week of May 8, 1964, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts released 32-year-old Joseph Barboza. Immediately, he took his blonde-haired, brown-eyed fiancée, Claire Cohen, to Maine's quaint seaside city of Portland. There, a justice of the peace presided over the nuptials. A rabbi later remarried them. As part of his bargain with Claire, fittingly enough, given his Old Testament demeanor, Joe was now officially a child of Abraham. To prove his loyalty, Joe presented himself to Beth Israel Hospital and submitted to the ancient and unpleasant rite of circumcision. Given the size of his penis, by his own account, he had some flesh to spare, at least. Joe also changed his last name to Byron. Baron, excuse me, B-A-R-O-N, possibly because he wanted to provide a cover for his wife and future children. There was too much history connected to the Barboza name. As Joe explained, this betrayal of name and faith reportedly upset old man Barboza, but Joe's move from Catholicism to Judaism didn't gentle in his condition. Once Joe asked, how important is it what we're doing here? We're so fucking small in the universe. We don't even exist. This worldview is ideal to let a murderer sleep well at night. Joe returned to East Boston with a stitched and sensitive penis. Unwilling to use a filthy bathroom, Joe requested a mission to the toilet at the Bendrock drugstore in Eastie. The owner refused and a greatly offended Joe offered him the choice words, well, I'm not threatening you. I'm promising you. The Eastie crew went to work that night. The next day, Joe Wynn returned to the drugstore. Plywood had replaced all the windows. Can I use the bathroom? Asked the animal. Sure, go ahead, Joe, said the chastised owner. Needing to revive his enterprises, the one-time leader of the cream pie bandits assembled a new crew of violent and unstable men. Primarily misfits, they all had their own reasons for joining Joe's East Boston gang. The Frizzies, Guy, Kono, and Nini, we have met. Early after Joe after excuse me, early after Joe hit the street, Guy introduced him to Joseph Amico, a good kid, at least in the inverted criminal sense. In his twenties, Joe habitu habitually assigned associates nicknames. 
and he called the 200 pounds six feet two inch amico chico in chico over time joe found an obedient friend pet and younger brother who as a former short order cook was also lethal with the blade another minion was the rotan nikki femia whom Joe affectionately called a fat bastard. That's funny. If someone just mentioned, why do you ever talk about Nicky Femi yet? They just messaged him, and now here he is. That was today, too. Another minion was the re retowned Nicky, Nicky Femi, whom Joe affectionately called a fat bastard. Dark complexion, although in his 20s, he looked about 40. Femi reminded Joe of a quack named Zorba who always figured things to perfection, but managed to never get anything right. So he called him Dr. Zorba. Among the 10 or so other young henchmen was Patrick Fimiano of East Boston, basically more an ill-fated clown than Doug. More formidable was Carlton Eaton, Carlton Eaton of Medford, who had replaced Joe as a bouncer down in Nantasket. Eaton was an ideal swap for the animal. Having drifted through his brief life as laborer, salesman, and convict, Joe also recruited in the Shylock and fronted him money. Along with the Bear and the Freezy brothers, these men formed a rotten core of Barboza Inc. For headquarters, Joe appropriated Chiambi's Grill in East Boston, which became Barboza's corner. The owner was too terrified to, Joe, to tell Joe to leave. When Nicky Femia rented an upstairs room, the proprietor never bothered to collect a cent from him. When not in Eastie, Joe frequented North Station near Boston Garden. He was also on various payrolls as salesman and clerk, and in another position in a public relations capacity. With the growing reputation as a hair trigger thug, rumors soon circulated that Joe committed uglier deeds, including murder most foolish. Joe claimed his first hit was a, a stooge, ex-convict, performed with a partner. It's not like you see on TV. We're all set to do him in, Joe said. We knock him down and he's out of it. Then I take my gun and start shooting till it's fucking empty. I see his eyes pop out. There's blood everywhere. It's unbelievable. Not everybody can kill. It's not easy. You can break kneecaps. You can punch people out. But to take a life, you know? That was his start. Joe was a car with one speed. He smashed, maimed, or killed at will and didn't bother to hide the bodies. High on uppers, Joe became a paranoid megalomaniac, said critics. Indeed, he admitted killing had a very tranquilizing effect on him. After a murder, he felt humble, at peace with the world, and slept in a baby-like peace for weeks. He wasn't that imaginative in homicide, nor was he a gun wizard. I don't know anything about pistols, he once noted. I fire guns. I can squeeze a trigger. Of his few tricks, he boasted cunning disguises. One of his favorite TV shows became Mission Impossible, and he emulated its appearance, shifting heroes. As an actor killer, Joe bragged his most outrageous role was that of an old lady including long dress, pancake makeup, gray wig, and a hat with a veil covering the face and mammoth jaw. To complete the ensemble, Joe carried a 45 in a handbag. The brothers Ventola, Arthur, and Junior formed a petty criminal entrepreneur duo. On the main strip in Revere, they opened the Ebb Tide, a club and restaurant which became a focal point for Joe and his flunkies. Inside a bar and dance floor, there were hidden offices ideal for secret meetings. The establishment underpaid office protection, the office, Raymond Patriarch's office, became a safe place for dangerous people. Arthur also operated his own ramshackle roadside vegetable stand named, not so imaginatively, Arthur's Farm. No actual, no actual farm that sold vegetables and groceries, but in the back of the store, Arthur also offered hot clothes and toys for crooks and honest citizens alike to rummage. Even pro ball players driving home from Harvard Stadium stopped him. After the Ebb Tide's grand opening, Guy Frizzy's youngest brother, Nini, complained about a water drink. In response, Junior Ventola beat Nini, and this quickly drove Joe and five of his crew to Arthur's farm to dispense justice. 
On arrival, armed with a bat, jaw ran right for Arthur, a big man in his mid-fifties, and wiped at his face. Arthur took that blow on his hands, but then Joe thumped him across his back a couple of times and even connected with the back of his head. From the ground, Arthur blubbered, it was Junior, my brother, that hit Nini. You're a big, tough man. You give up your brother, Joe said. Would you give up your mother? Joe claimed this beating wasn't a mistake, as Arthur had it coming. In any case, in Joe's Darwinian Nietzschean jungle, Ventola was a mere buzzard who had to rely on the strength of the office for protection. Joe would view Jerry and Julo in the same light. Joe returned to the ebb tide beat manager Richie Gastucci and promised to return the next night and kill no less than everyone. Soon after, an office-connected man from Chelsea named Ronnie Cassesso called Joe to chat. A career thug, Ronnie was fat and rotten, with a massive double chin and thick lips that rarely formed a smile. Although not made, he worked for the Chelsea-based capital regime of Joe Burns. Under Henry Tomelio's orders, Ronnie asked Joe to forget the Ventola beef. Naturally, as an inspiring, strong man, Joe knew of Tamalio and that he frequented the ebb tide. Joe also knew it was unwise to cross a distinguished-looking old man. I am only here in the way of strength, Joe told Ronnie. Although still feeling Junior's legs requiring breaking, he let the matter slide. Joe accepted Henry's invitation to meet at the ebb tide. While chatting, Henry said, Joe, this is what happens when you get involved with weak assholes. They run off at the mouth because of your borrowed strength. He promised there would be no more insults. Joe swooned at this treatment. After nearly blowing Junior's brains out, Joe fashioned a working truce with him, always calling him the shit. Once for a hefty price, Joe and his crew even beat up the lover of Junior's ex-girlfriend in a movie theater. Henry Tamale, like many who use violence as a business tool, didn't want recreational mayhem near his own properties. In this case, the ebb tide, as Henry also was frequently a guest in the ebb tide, it became the hottest spot in town with the hottest telephone number. By October 1964, Joe's duties included keeping order there and dishing out beatings to rowdies. He discovered Henry was the glue that held the office together, preventing it from disintegrating into a mere street gang. The guy is more or less public relations for Raymond Patriarca, smooth talker, the man that has a father's image, very sharp-minded, a tremendous personality, Joe reflected later. The animal who lacked a father who hated authority, had finally, in the early middle age, found a powerful man he didn't despise. Over time, Joe developed an infatuation with the powerful Henry. He once told Tamalio, everybody in the city knows I look up to you more than any man living. I told Raymond to his face, I like you more than him because I spent days with you and only hours with him. Raymond respected you more for saying it than he does those other ass kissers, Henry replied. But even Joe could see Henry wasn't like anyone else in the New England underworld. His last caller dated way back to 1931, when Providence police picked him up as a suspicious person. I got arrested as a professional gambler, Henry admitted of that incident many years later. I've learned a whole lot from then up until now. In any case, the Providence charge hadn't stuck. Born in 1901, Henry at age 13, legend boasted, was cleaning spittoons in Detroit. Henry's theft of an automobile at 17 in Rhode Island officially started his underworld career. Caught and convicted, he earned a stay at the state's adult correctional institution, and that sentence, if anything, confirmed him in his vocation. By 27, Henry was a great mechanic, work hard player, a master of gin, with or without cheating. During the next two decades, Massachusetts convicted Henry of a string of petty gaming and motor vehicle offenses. During his time, claimed Vinnie Teresa, Henry expanded his already extensive curriculum that tie. Besides placing wagers, Henry murdered and ordered killings, robbed, handled stolen goods, loan shark, and set up fraudulent diamond rackets, but he avoided the worst wrath. In the early 50s, Raymond's decision to make Henry his underboss may have been his shrewdest ever. 
Given his seniority, Henry could have been the boss himself, but he liked the good life too much. He didn't want to be aloof and reserved like Raymond. Henry and Ray got along famously, said Tamalio's close friend. Not even Raymond would duck Henry for any reason. Not even Uncle Ray would interfere when Henry called something. If that's not power, I don't know what the hell is. A mafia statesman and diplomat, he also made the peace and kept many people alive as he saw it necessary. This is why some called him the referee and guys up on it's a long chapter. I know probably only gonna do one tonight in the chat. Bear with me. If anyone's still there, thank you. I'm all into this though. I love it. And apologize too if any of the names I'm saying aren't right. I know a lot of people like to like to be like, oh, it's this, it's that. I get it. You know, I make mistakes. I apologize. It's not intentional. Back to it. Diplomat, he also made the peace and kept many people alive as he saw it necessary. This is why some called him the referee. He could use politicians as playthings. When necessary, he'd reach a governor, police chief, city councilman, or congressman. He could have remained in Rhode Island, but as he put it, some fellow was in trouble and revere. Henry need, needed to intercede, and over the northern border, he came into the Bay State. It was the worst move I ever made in my life. As the 1960s rolled around, Henry was possibly the most respected, well-recognized, and feared man in New England organized crime. He looked the part of a statesman. At 5 feet 10 and 180 pounds, he was, by his own boast, all arms and chest, no belly at all, no time. He carried a hard-lined face with a frown for a mouth. His somber eyes were brown-black, except for a fringe of white hair on the sides and back of his head. He was bald. Rounding off the image, he wore glasses and dressed conservatively, favoring white socks and suspenders. Possessing a diplomat's manner, Henry was soft-spoken and deceptively gentle and pleasant, and he carried himself with uncommon dignity. In the right office, someone might have taken him as a financier, a legitimate one, or a priest. Some called him Henry the Banker. To the right people, Henry demonstrated strict scruples. I did the right thing with anybody, he once reflected. If I make a promise, my word is my bond. Raymond appointed him to oversee the weekly kitty, a multi-purpose fund to cover legal bills or offer short-term disability that all office workers paid into. In admiration, and few men are heroes to their chauffeurs, Vinnie called him Uncle Henry. He warned Vinny, never trust anyone, no matter who it is. His effect was powerful. I knew Henry when I was a kid, recalled one particularly dangerous associate. I loved Henry. He was the most wonderful human being of my life, a gentleman. He was a good, good man. He was gentle, but you didn't cross him. If you did, he ended up in the grave. He'd ice you in a he'd ice you in a heartbeat. Henry could snap his fingers and have someone put in a box as opposed to burying bodies in a reputed land-based mafia graveyard. Henry preferred burial at sea, where the sharks could devour the evidence, said one acquaintance. On paper, Henry was wealthy with real estate and other investments. Although a family man, Henry enjoyed a playboy's life, tasty food, attractive and rentable women, expensive liquor, and cabaret entertainments. Henry would drop 30K in a weekend and think nothing of it. He was the sort of dinner, he was the sort of diner that waiters fight to serve. The size of his tip often matched the cost of the meal itself. Henry came up to Boston and Revere once a week, frequently engaging the services of women with whom he'd spend the night at a hotel. Henry could handle more booze than anyone Teresa had seen, able to drink from 11 a.m. to 3 a.m. the next day and function on three hours sleep. Vinny claimed he would drop Henry off in a Boston hotel and would, in a few hours, receive a call to hurry up and retrieve him. His great vice was wagering horses, cards, and dice. The banker blew as much as $1 million on gaming. Raymond estimated in 1961, Henry admitted losses that forced him to mortgage out his family's house. He didn't always care about the stakes. In fact, he once bragged to Jerry and Raymond about a $140 pot he pocketed after playing until 6 that morning. 
He required five dollars in change so he could place his cross-country bets using a payphone. Naturally, he took great interest in a device that illegally made the payphone spit the coins back out. Henry also gambled on certain street toughs he thought might be useful. He drew dull-witted men who craved the prestige of dealing with the mafia, in short, suckers like Joe. He noticed Joe wanted as much of the rackets as he could rip off as he cultivated the younger man expertly. Once, when down below, as Joe called a Providence trek from Boston with Henry at the Roman Gardens restaurant, Joe ate calamari and listened closely. Henry discussed the recently and unnaturally deceased Jackie Narzion. Henry walked Joe to the lounge section, pointed to a corner and said he, Jackie Nazarian, was sitting right there drinking. Obscene and drunk, Jackie boasted of taking over the office. I calmed him down and took him home, Henry recalled. He was of no use to us anymore. Uncontrollable. All right, we got to do like a little, that, there's like a little big uh, gap right there. And surprisingly, there's still a couple of people there. Well, so what I'm going to do anymore, I think, guys, is I'm going to just um, – like read on my own or maybe like do the pre record so then like images could come up of the people that I'm talking about and stuff. So look at this. These nightly ones is more like an audio type thing, you know, until, uh, cause I can't just keep going like this. For example, like I was trying it the other night, but I can't, for instance, be talking about one person be like, and then this, you know, and then and then go to this when these guys when they come up, and then you know, Buddy McLean, like you know, it would be nice to hit all their pick, picks as I'm talking about them, but with the lives, it's tough. So, like I said, just look at it like an audio thing or whatever. Even though the mic that I have sucks right here, I think in another one. So uh, give me time on that. But hmm. these chapters usually are a lot quicker. This one's a big one. Let's get to, I see comments, but let's see. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, you guys are just talking much. Keep talking. That's great. Keep it rocking. What's up, Leon? You still there? Oh, thank you, Tracy. I don't know. I like, can see because for me personally, it's like, it would be more like an audio though type based thing instead of just being like doing doing a show, reading a book. I know anyone could read a book, but maybe we'll do it like where I read some chapters and then I come on and I'd be like, so guys, on the uh, this chapter here, Buddy McLean, when he, um, let me tell you about his murder and blah blah, you know, something like that along those lines, because we already read the over half the book online because i yeah i started this from the beginning and i want to obviously i heard you paint houses i have to uh do just because of just the area i'm from and then we can talk a real lot about that because i know a lot of the back end and since we're doing the bulger docu series just this stuff here is like instead of just bulger's crew i mean there's so much bob out there like new england with the patriarch and Julos, all the way back to barboza back to uh who was the first ever um first ever yeah informant put into uh witness protection joe barboza and um they got him in uh san francisco uh oh uh, what's the guy's name um russo russo john joe i want to see johnny russo is it or jr jr russo i know i'm right on the russo though and yeah, he got him shotgun and i think it was in san francisco though where barboza was killed but uh, I want to know it all, like, you know, where it all stems from. There are all this stuff that's going on here, like about white, like Whitey's time. Whitey's in Alcatraz right now or in Atlanta. Like he's not even, uh, he's just a bank robber doing time right now until he gets out. But, um, and they didn't really, I mean, they dressed Buddy McLean and then Howie Winter was brought up a little bit. So I'm sure it'll be going into that. And let's see what else we got left on this chapter. Don't worry, I'm not good. Um, not bad, but um, 
guys definitely feel free to uh just keep talking and <laughs> keep it rocking guys please subscribe if you don't mind uh i really appreciate it and uh we're oh thank you too for another 100 subs in uh 20 some days that's awesome guys and i think we're up to over 1700 now and um i kept my deal with you as i was saying to sub and I'm not going to uh, monetize or put ads up and be a pain in the ass for now, but uh, we'll see, you know, money's, you know, money gets tight at times, but now we're good. Let's see. Cost of admission is subscribe, or you could just be an asshole and just not subscribe and watch your call. Just kidding. Guys. Hold on. I should roll with that. No, nah, because it's not the South Boston Irish mob, right? Uh, guys, my Instagram, too, besides the email, D underscore Buffalino underscore family, if you need to contact me, get me direct there on the Instagram. All right, part two. Let's do this. One of Joe's first jobs for the office was to chastise an independent bookmaker at the track. After someone fingered the bookie named Bozo, Joe grabbed a banister post and beat him with the warning to stop working that venue. Joe also recruited jockeys to pull for the office. In this operation, Joe loaned the jockey money and then threatened the athlete, only to have Henry intervene at the last moment and clear the debt. After that, the jockey would do as Henry commanded in a race. Given his role as enforcer, Joe also had to go down the street to meet with the Angelos. Joe offered at least one beating on behalf of Raymond and Henry, aptly named Piranha Incorporated, finance and insurance company. A Piranha loan could come with a 20% plus interest rate. However, not even Joe's reputation exceeded that of Pete and Glady's, the two actual Piranhas that swam in the company's fish tank. After employees stuck one deadbeat's hand into the tank for the fish to chew. Everyone paid up, said Vinnie Teresa. Joe also enjoyed side jobs for impatient, legitimate creditors, unwilling to endure the law's delay. Given his predilection for violence, some observers believe that Joe, accepting his Portuguese nationality, not to mention Jewish faith, might have taken the sacred communion of La Cosa Nostra. That is dubious and was like saying J. Edgar Hoover could have become Pope, except he was a Protestant and not Italian. Certainly, Joe envied and resented the office's monopoly on the rackets, particularly the lending one. But it's dubious he never seriously thought of merging with the Italian faction. Nevertheless, when Joe learned Raymond wanted to meet him, he naturally obeyed the summons. For the interview with Patriarcha, he, Ronnie Cassesso, and Jimmy the Bear drove to Federal Hill and parked in the Roman Gardens car lot. Raymond, like Ronnie, having appreciated his silence at their first meeting, someone who is very quiet is either a fool or very smart, Raymond had observed later. Joe and his friends ate a quick breakfast at 11 a.m., walked to the Coinomatic address, one of the city's two rival capital buildings. Almost in eyesight was a magnificent domed edifice of marble where the governor and the assembly pretended to run the upper world. On entering Coinomatic, Joe discovered the office hidden behind a partition on the left side. It was 12 feet wide and 20 feet long and far from classy, more poor than rich, but would-be gangsters climbed ladders covered in blood to be there and renewed the appointment with his protege and arrived with coffee. Joe laid eyes on Raymond in a dark blue suit and white socks. On his finger was a white gold ring sporting four diamonds, each a carat or more in a line. Henry said, this is Joe Barboza. My pleasure, Mr. Patriarcha, said Joe. Call me Raymond. Joe looked into Raymond's piercing eyes and noted the Don's features. Under the coned back black hair were those of a hawk. However, the mouth resembled a lizard's and was a purplish from diabetes. After an hour, the trio left. During the ride back to Boston, the bear noted, you didn't have much to say in there. What were you thinking? I was thinking how I could bite his finger off 
and get that diamond ring, Joe said. The bear and Ronnie laughed. Joe asked, what the fuck is funny? The meeting, however, brief, was the beginning of another career-advancing professional relationship or so, Joe hoped. Over time, he and the bear regularly visited the office to receive assignments and clear jobs, including assassinations. The Don enlightened his dull instrument about the width of his grasp. Raymond mentioned New Bedford and said, I got a bookmaker down there, Sullivan, that wants to quit. Joe had never heard of him. Even though he ran the biggest pot in town, I want you to rough him up, but not really hurt him. Just give him a slap in the mouth and toss him around. I don't want to break any bones or anything. Two weeks later, Raymond canceled the contract without explanation. The animal was a free agent. Raymond Patriarcha kind of isolated me, as Joe put it, which met my approval very highly because I didn't like Jerry and Julo and his ways, and I didn't like a lot of people involved in the family. If his own brigade became, if his own brigade caused a problem, Raymond could assemble 37 professional assassins within a half hour and place them anywhere in New England. They, the mafioso, did something 10 years ago and they figure they don't have to do anything but play center field for the rest of their lives. Raymond confided to the animal. For Joe, a mere hired hand, the alliance with a strategic move as a freelance contractor, he avoided paying tribute on his shy like locking business that could have cost as much as $5,500 a week. Just then, Peter Lamoni was shutting down all the independent operators around Joe. Those who remained had to pay 50% of their take. I gave them a little more than that in the way of strength, Joe concluded. I was an enforcer that kept the enforcers in line. Jerry resented this, Joe believed, and badmouthed him, as did the other main men. One night, Joe tried to enter the mobbed-up Coliseum with his crew. He recently performed a hit, and the police were tailing him like seagulls, Manager and Mafia Capo, Sammy Granito, stopped the East Boston crew cold and said, what the fuck you think you're doing coming in here, bringing heat on my place? What are you, stupid? Get the fuck out of here before you get us all in trouble. Joe shrugged like a confused dog and left. Another mafioso who got on Joe's bad side was Louis Greco. He was a 230-pound mountain without great, powerful hands and a knockout punch. Greco warned Nicky Femia not the front money to teenagers in his East Boston neighborhood. Femia kept loaning charking anyway, and Greco cornered him. I knocked him down, as Greco said. One punch, Femia ran into the store at the corner of Bennington and Brook Street. Barboza was there. I was chasing Nicky around the store, trying to catch him, but I can't run. Joe never forgot him. the humiliation. Other independents weren't interested in partnering with Joe. They included Frankie and Stevie Fleming, who both disliked him. Frankie even told Joe he didn't want him around his shops. With a gang war going, you didn't want everybody mobbed up down there, as Frankie observed. The more you keep away from your area, the better off you are. The normal truck thieves, that's one thing. However, besides doing muscle work with the bear, Joe partnered with two office-affiliated Italians, Ronnie Cassisso and his partner, Joseph Romeo Martin. Although he wrote poems, which was the wherefore, he was called Romeo. Martin was a very tough U.S. Army deserter in his late 30s and a professional gambler, housebreaker, and strongman on both coasts. Everybody on either side of the law liked him. On the East Coast, Romeo and Ronnie worked under Ralph Ralphie Chong Lamatina, who reported to Capo Joe Burns. Romeo also snitched and even bragged falsely he'd done time with Raymond and became his pal and had become his pal, which he lied about. In early 1964, Joe Burns approached Raymond for the first time in three years and asked to baptize Romeo. Raymond felt Burns hadn't proposed the name properly. Burns hadn't shopped Romeo around the organization yet to see if anyone had any objection. Shrewdly, Raymond observed Burns was building up his ground with a lot of young fellows looking for his furniture advantage. Sorry, looking for his Jesus Christ, am I tired? Looking for his future advantage. Romeo wasn't made. About a page and a half, guys. 
At 4.15 p.m. on Thursday, May 14th, 1964, a patrolman was making his rounds driving near 3 McDonough Way in South, East, in South Boston. He took note of a 1963 Pontiac sedan, minus plates parked at the Old Harbor Village Projects. The police pried open a window and threw the windshield registration sticker, traced the car's origin. The prior November, someone had stolen the vehicle with the owner's golf clubs in its trunk. The police left the car in a garage on West Broadway where its owner, 57-year-old Marvin Cohen, could retrieve it. At around 8 p.m., Cohen arrived at the garage with his wife. I then went to the trunk to see if my golf clubs were still there, Cohen recalled. It was dark when I lifted the lid and found a body lying on its stomach. He pushed his wife away and told the garage attendant to call the police. A sergeant arrived and examined the body that he soon learned was minus the head. Using the fingerprints, the police discovered it had been a 32-year-old ex-convict named Francis Regis Benjamin. He'd been a frame carpenter, roofer, laborer, and petty crook. After serving five years for armed robbery, Benjamin had left MCI Walpole two weeks before and moved in with his wife on Norwell Street in Dorchester. He appeared to favor the McLean group. Officially, the Bennett Roxbury group then sided with Punchy and Georgie. Worse, he threatened one of Whitby's clients, a local restaurant owner. Whitby, wanting to blind the customer even closer to him, prodded the Fleming brothers to swap Benjamin. Late one night, the unlucky Benjamin was in the Waters Lounge sitting with Wimpy and the bear. Stevie was also present. Suddenly, one of the Fleming brothers shot him in the head with the policeman's revolver. This officer then complained that the bullet was traceable to his weapon. So Jimmy the bear lopped the head off with the meat saw, claimed one story. Possibly the bear entertained leaving the head someplace where it would maximize shock value, such as a front doorstep, but thought better of it. The conspirators dragged the body from the booth where the shooting had occurred to the kitchen and from there to the storage room. The corpse spread blood everywhere it went. The Bennett brothers declared Walters closed and summoned Stevie's partner, Frank Cadillac Salemi, an electrician by trade. Frankie arrived and noted the lounge door had a sign hanging there stating closed for electrical problems. At the Bennett's request, Frankly proceeded to mess up the electrical box so it looked like a fire had disabled it. Frankie, with the group, wrapped the body, then blocked off the adjacent alley while it was taken to a car. Frankie drove a second vehicle, the crash car, to block any police cruisers. For a disposal operation to be successful, you needed five men, as he later observed. Although a career criminal, Frankie claimed he'd been a virgin when it came to snuffing people until now. Later, Stevie torched select areas of the lounge to eradicate the bloodstains. Benjamin's trunk and head would have to wait till Judgment Day to end their divorce. No one ever made public who actually took the head or where its resting place is. Something burned or buried somewhere, but the gruesome news traveled fast in the underworld. And the prime culprit was the bear. When Joe saw Jimmy, he said, I heard you killed Benjamin and cut his head off. I heard you did it, was the reply. Months after the grisly discovery, the bear claimed the hit on Benjamin had paid off well. Some even began calling him the butcher. Perhaps it had been profitable, but such a murder was more than just a business necessity. The bear liked killing people. The simmering war was a great opportunity. He wanted notches on his gun, as if these were the days of the O.K. Corral, and the more notches, the bigger the man he'd be. Frankie Salemi observed, Plus, he wanted to be Mr. Macho around the gang. I am going to the number one hitman in the area, the bear told an informer. All I want to do is kill people. It's better than hitting banks. As FBI agent Condon reported, Fleming offered to help the informer kill anyone. He contrasted his own professionalism with that of his rivals. Some hitmen even took money for contracts without fulfilling them. One pair of would-be murderers had even spent all their front-end contracted 
all their front end contract money drinking without exec without executing the commission, excuse me. The bear offered full services as he also disposed of the of the as the cadavers. His one time South End neighbors believed he used the furnaces in the public housing project as crematoriums. A local noted how once the newspapers trumpeted the bear's killing of the wrong man. I've got to stop doing that, Fleming promised and giggled softly. And anyone who's new here, the bear is Stephen Fleming's brother, who makes Stevie look like an altar boy. Despite the savagery with Benjamin, Hoover wanted the bear as part of his top echelon effort. On Tuesday, May 12, 1964, a Wilmington Park Department employee was about to cut a strand of grass near the town pumping station. Something unusual caught his eye, just 10 feet from the road. It was a long body under a jacket, clad in a T-shirt, black trousers, and black shoes. Nearby on the road was a pair of sunglasses with one broken wing and a wallet containing a diamond ring and $78. Two patrolmen arrived and fanned out to search. Soon po police identified the body as having been Russell Nicholson. The prior night, someone had pumped a 32 caliber bullet into his left temple. The killer might even use Nicholson's own weapon on him before dumping him into the ditch from a car. Georgie had terrified Nicholson, and just weeks before he'd been even admitted to Joe McCain, as he was a dead man. As a sideline, the one-time Metropolitan District Commission detective worked with the Charleston hoodlum, one Fat Harry, shaking down legitimate businessmen, the FBI claimed, at 9 a.m. on Monday, May 11th, Nicholson had left his home with Harry, and now he was dead. Both Georgie and Harry were suspects. The state police found bloodstains in Harry's car, which also spotted a new front seat. The interior had also been wiped down with liquid that left the floor tacky. Harry, however, refused to answer any questions about his ex-one-time partner's demise. In February, as Harry faced trial for extortion, the prosecutor possibly considered charging him in Nicholson's murder, too. To avoid that, Harry pled out to extortion and was sentenced to a three to five year term. It was probably safer in jail anyway. That was a long chapter. Wow, there are people still in the house. So, guys, give me a second. I feel like, you know, like when your lights are off and then you turn them on, it's like, and that ring light's like, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was a long chapter. All right. Let's get things moving now here. We got the comment. Oh, it's just you two love birds still. Tracy and La Senorita, they're in love. I love it. Drink, drink some water. <laughs> Back in the mirror. I need a bad, but I also have, though, that you know me and my voice, so don't get me started. I'm surprised I'm still even doing these lives. But, guys, um, that's half the book. And, uh, holy shit, that's. And again, these, this isn't like the Mafia Truth Show. Like, this is just at nighttime. I usually like to read and stuff, so why not come, come on and just read a true crime book? This isn't like, so if anyone's new here, this isn't like the show Mafia Truth. You know, that's every Sunday at 8, and then we're going to do it on Saturday during the day, too. So um, this is just come on and, you know, read some true crime history and then chat about it and talk about it. And, um, yeah, all that good stuff like that. I think I'm going to uh, watch The Offer again tonight for fucking like the 10th time. What a show. And uh, The Tulsa King with, with Stallone, no, I actually, uh, I started enjoying it. Just for what it is, you get into it. It's not bad. He actually, I think he does a pretty good job at that as well. Secret is out, ladies. Secret is out. So we are on four salesmen and a Spaniard, Spaniard, Gladiator. I haven't seen that in a while. Anyway, four, what do I say? Four salesmen and a Spaniard in my ADD or ADHD. Um, chapter 14 next. This is the Boston Mob, guys. If you want to read it yourself, 
It kind of was just a whole overflow from Raymond Patriarcha to Bolger to uh, and 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 then just to all the inner workings, and even like with the Winter Hill Gang with Buddy McLean and everyone in there um, through it, even when Whitey wasn't even around. So uh, that's what really got my interest on this because uh, I know a lot about the Whitey story and I just want to really know uh, all the players that have been around, who built it, the, the whole, um, what's the word I'm looking for, the whole uh, ancestry of that or whatever the fuck. But guys, thank you so much. Subscribe to um, Mafia Truth, please. This Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern, season one. I believe it'll be episode four. Uh, I I can't say the guest yet because it's either one or the other. They just have to figure out the time slot, but I'll have it in like a few days. And if any of you guys want to be a guest or want to talk on the show, remember I always say this is the uh, this channel here is for the people. So. I'd love, anyone subscribed could absolutely ever come on or what, whatever and help out too with this docu-series. I can't stress this enough to anyone that wants an opportunity and uh, get your name in the IMDB and all that. There's, there's producer credits available. There's, uh, like I said, to me and Christina Buffalino, right now, uh, well, I'm producing it. She's associated producer. There's still credits for that. We still need some Italian gangsters for actors. Um, and uh, the Irish, I believe, yeah, yeah, that's all cast up. And, uh, and extras, obviously. But uh, this is definitely the real deal, so I can't stress that enough. And uh, Jacqueline, who you saw yesterday, she was on. She'll be playing Deborah Davis. And uh, we just have a real, real, real good solid cast and a solid team. And uh, it's just happening fast, you know. Started this YouTube channel. Well, I started this YouTube channel in 2014, but then I fucking uh, really started it during the Johnny Depp trial again after I got clean. And then I, uh, it's just funny. That was only like seven, eight months ago. And now we're making a docu-series. So it's crazy. So yeah, anyone wants to jump in, reach out, jump in. And um, you can follow me on Facebook too at Loomis Santoro. You'll find me there, Mafia Truth on Facebook. Oh, yeah, we're like 10 away from 1,000 on TikTok to go live over there. Uh, what a world that place is. TikTok, <laughs> I, I'm fucking, I never, I don't even, I'm not even going to get into it. But uh, what a world. That's all I'll say. Uh, so we're 20 away from being able to jump on over there. And then uh, <laughs> TikTok. There's this video I fucking saw. The guy looked like Wild Bill. I'm like, are you fucking... And then I looked, there's like 25,000 people watching a Wild Bill from fucking... Um, what is it? Uh, Silence of the fucking Lambs. And he's fucking like dancing with fucking glow sticks. And I'm like, ah, I don't know if I want to enter TikTok world, though. It's, it's... And then you got like girls, though, like who are like, you know, cooking breakfast with fucking... Uh, you know, the camera behind them so that their ass is wet. And listen, guys, if you want to watch that, you can watch that. But I mean, that's just, I don't know. It's just a different world over there. Um, but but we're 20 away from the thousands. Thanks, TikTok. Uh, and uh, I think that's it. Uh, shout outs to Crime and Entertainment, Hollywood Wade. Give them a follow, give them a subscribe. Great. One of my favorite true crime shows. And uh, shout out to all you guys who watch and uh, subscribe. And thank you guys so much. And uh, again, I really mean that. Reach out if you want any involvement on this. So with that, what time is it? Oh, yeah, the hour's up. How about that? I did it again. Getting my rounds in. Thanks again, guys. We'll see you possibly tomorrow, Thursday-ish. No, tomorrow's Tuesday, Wednesday-ish. Whenever the fuck we'll see each other. Thanks, guys, and uh, see you soon. Shut the fuck up. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, he's going to close it out with the tune, right? Dun, 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 dun. <clears throat>